And good evening. With less than three weeks to go until Election Day, President Biden tonight pulling out all the stops to try to secure a victory for the Democrats come November. His focus today, the pain Americans are feeling at the pump. The president announcing that he will tap into the country's strategic reserve yet again, releasing 15 million more barrels of oil. The move in effort to lower the price of gas for Americans, an average gallon still costing $3.85, a troubling sign for Democrats, with the economy remaining a key issue for voters. Congresswoman Val Demings, just one of the many Democrats vying for a Senate seat that could determine the control of Congress. The Florida representative clashing with Republican Marco Rubio in a heated debate. And in Arizona, the influence of Donald Trump being put to the test. Trump-backed candidate for governor Carrie Lake getting help from the GOP and a former high-profile Democrat. Her Democratic opponent, Katie Hobbs, slipping in the polls. Our Von Hilliard is in Tucson with much more on that race in just a moment. But we want to begin with the strategic move from the president and our chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander. Tonight, under pressure over the economy, President Biden announcing a move aimed at lowering high gas prices, releasing 15 million barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Drawdowns on the reserve so far have played a big role in bringing down oil prices. We're going to continue to responsibly use that national asset. It's the final batch of 180 million barrels from the nation's stockpile that the president last spring pledged to release over six months. Today, saying the reserve is still more than half full and that he plans to refill it. But Republicans are blasting the move that comes less than three weeks before the midterms. It's strategic petroleum reserve. It's not the political petroleum reserve. The president insisting his decision is not about helping Democrats, but all Americans. It's not politically motivated at all. It comes amid a crackdown on Russian oil and after President Biden's controversial visit to Saudi Arabia, where the Saudis rejected U.S. efforts for them to pump more oil, instead recently announcing a production cut. The president today touting a summer drop in gas prices, though they're climbing again, now 3.85 a gallon nationwide. Tonight, soaring inflation, including that pain at the pump, is a top issue driving voters. These gas prices are getting high. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's pretty brutal, yeah. Don't go out too much then. Astrid Playtez and her husband Alex own a produce farm in rural Virginia, but high gas prices are taking a bite out of their bottom line. We're spending double on gas and triple on diesel. In the last year, their fuel costs have soared from nearly $900 to $1,900 a week. After they drive their produce to farmers markets, they're left with virtually no profit. This is personal for your family in a way, isn't it? This is our livelihood and yeah, this is how we pay bills, feed our families and you know, um, feed other families because I we have eight employees. All of it front and center for voters with races heating up in key states, including Florida, with a fiery debate overnight between Republican Senator Marco Rubio and Democratic Congresswoman Val Demings. Peter, one of those key midterm races that everyone is talking about, the Pennsylvania Senate race where Democratic candidate John Fetterman, who recently suffered a stroke, is in a close race with Dr. Oz. I know you have some new reporting tonight. Yeah, that's right, Tom. After questions about John Fetterman's health, including during a recent NBC News interview, the Fetterman campaign today released a letter from the candidate's doctor saying that Fetterman is recovering well, that he has symptoms of an auditory processing disorder, but that he has no work restrictions. His opponent, Mehmet Oz, calling it good news, but saying it means Fetterman should agree to a second debate. Tom. All right, Peter Alexander leading us off tonight. Peter, thank you. We want to turn now to Arizona, where candidates are battling it out with midterm elections just 20 days away. Gubernatorial candidate and Trump favorite Carrie Lake gaining more GOP support in recent days and now getting support from key GOP leaders and even a former controversial high-profile Democrat. Vaughn Hilliard is in Arizona with the latest. Carrie Lake, the woman on Donald Trump's list of favorite 2022 candidates. Oh, you're so lucky. I see some of the people running in other places. I say, boy, is Arizona lucky. You're so lucky. Is getting backup support this week from a broader swath of her political party in her race for Arizona governor. I feel like a rock star up here, Tulsi. You are a rock star, Carrie. Tulsi Gabbard, the former Democratic congresswoman and presidential candidate who has drifted right and formally left the party this week, campaigning on Tuesday night alongside Lake, a former Democrat and Obama supporter herself. And then a few people asked me as I was coming here, they found out I was coming here, they're like, you're going to support Carrie Lake. That seems a little odd. I said, it's only odd if you're focused on the wrong things. 
in another sign of this race's national implications. Carrie, you are awesome. Glenn Youngkin, the Republican governor who won a stunning upset last year in Virginia, more recently a blue state. The two hoping to create a lasting alliance. Potentially even on the national stage. Lake's Democratic opponent sitting for an interview with Arizona PBS. Hobbs has continued to avoid debating Carrie Lake, saying it would only give a platform to her opponent's election denying. In response, Lake's campaign on Tuesday night made a mockery of that decision. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Secretary of State Katie Hobbs. Also today, Democratic Senator Mark Kelly on the trail as he tries to hold off his Trump-backed Republican challenger, Blake Masters, in the final 20 days. I've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of volunteers uh, that are out there making phone calls, knocking on doors to get out the vote. We want a lot of people to vote. All right, Vaughn Hillier joins us now from Arizona. Now, Vaughn, uh, and we see that you're joined by some beautiful uh, cacti there. Love that live shot there, Vaughn. Vaughn, give us a quick check on the polls in both these races. Right, this is where Mark Kelly actually had just wrapped up a campaign event here. And in the polls, right now, he has a lead and consistently has over Republican Blake Masters, but it's an insignificant one. And that is why you have seen millions of dollars come in here in recent weeks on, the, on behalf of the Republican in this race. And in that governor's race, there's multiple polls over the last week that show this in a dead heat. And it's hard not to look back at 2020, Tom, when Joe Biden won the state by just over 10,000 votes. Yeah, it's going to be a close one in both those races. That's what those polls are showing. You know, Vaughn, I want to ask you, because you've been covering this race from the get-go. I think you were the first reporter to, to talk about Carrie Lake on an NBC News broadcast. And I want to ask you, she's getting so many headlines now. We, as we mentioned, that race is very tight, but she's a political newcomer. She's making a lot of headlines for the things she's saying, for, for denying election results. But is she doing anything right to win over voters there? Well, you see it there in the polling here, and over the last 24 hours, choosing to campaign with Tulsi Gabbard and Glenn Youngkin, she's trying to broaden her appeal to conservatives who had left the Republican Party to vote for Democrats in recent years, as well as those independent voters. You know, Carrie Lake was on TV here for nearly 25 years as an evening anchor. She was known across Arizona, and her appeal to the voters here in the state has been, I understand you, I know you, I don't need D.C. consultants. Over the course of the last year and a half, she hasn't paid D.C. consultants to do polling, to determine what she should say on issues. And that is where you have seen her develop policies over the last year, talking about immigration, the economy, water issues here, trying to connect with voters. Of course, the election denialism has made this a challenge for her. There have been independents and Republican voters, as well as Republican officials even, who have called her out and said that they're going to vote for the Democrat, Katie Hobbs, because of that here. At the same time, that is where the big question mark is. Is she able to win enough of those voters in to pull off a victory. And if she does, it's clear, based off of Donald Trump and Glenn Youngkin's reception to her, she could have a bright political future in this Republican Party. Tom? Our man in Arizona, Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, we appreciate it. With candidates in key elections vying for voters in the final days before the midterms, I want to bring in NBC News senior political editor, my good friend, Mark Murray, to break down this all of this for us. Mark, before we get into individual races, over the last two elections, a lot has been said and researched on Trump voters, right, and whether or not they agree to be polled. Trump isn't on the ballot or in office. Do we think there's a chunk of voters on the right who are not being included in those polls? And I ask this because so many races across the country are razor thin right now. Yeah, Tom, you know, after the polling misses in 2016 and 2020, I think it's important for everyone to have a healthy amount and skepticism about the polls. And really, the polls can tell us if a race is close. And Vaughn was just going through the Arizona Senate and gubernatorial contests that are very close. But they can't really give us any kind of precision. So if one candidate's leading over two or three points, we really can't actually determine who's going to end up winning that contest. So it's better to use the polls to say, is a race close or not, versus we know that someone is certain going to win if they're ahead by two or three points. And is so that's that's my guidance, and I, I think we, we have a lot of close races across the country. Yeah, no, we do. And so I want to get to Florida, right, because we just saw that in Peter's report. Polls have Senator Marco Rubio slightly ahead, but really not by much. 
How did Congresswoman Val Demings handle the battle-tested Rubio, who has won two Senate campaigns but had a tough time in his race for president, and, and clearly he's having a tough time surging ahead of Demings? Yeah, at last night's debate, we saw her play offense on issues like abortion, on gun control. But then Marco Rubio, the incumbent senator, ended up swinging back, uh, particularly on matters like inflation and the economy, hitting Val Demings for or socialism. And Val Demings has a really strong biography. She's a former police chief. Her husband's a former police chief. And so she's been able to uh, repel some of the attacks that we've seen Republicans have on other Democrats for allegedly being soft on crime. But as you ended up mentioning, Florida's a really tough state for Democrats. Barack Obama's the last Democrat to have won that in a major contest statewide. And so it is an uphill climb, but it is close. Yeah. Okay, we want to turn out of Arizona. Carrie Lake has become a breakout star for the GOP. How much will it hurt Katie Hobbs that she decided not to debate? And do you think this is about Carrie Lake maybe running a good campaign, or, or is it Katie Hobbs deciding not to debate that will ultimately decide this race? Yeah, again, Tom, I actually think what's going to decide this race or is really going to come down to the voters and which side actually probably ends up appealing to a lot of the independent voters that actually make up a plurality of all registered voters in the state of Arizona. We've seen past winners, be it Mark Kelly, Joe Biden, Kirsten Sinema, do well with that middle of the electorate. But as you mentioned, sometimes, you know, when you say I'm not going to show up in a debate, as the Vaughn's package ended up showing that your opponents can, can brand you as a chicken and and it is noteworthy to me that sometimes to have a candidate who is so bombastic, as well as charismatic as Carrie Lake is, for Katie Hobbs, the Democratic nominee, to show up and say, you know what, I can actually best you on the debate stage as well, too. I'm not as sure this race is going to come down to whether or not someone showed up on the debate stage, but certainly being able to display strength and being for an office like governor is always important. Speaking of the debate stage, we're going to see that big debate in Pennsylvania soon. It's been almost a week since our Dasha Burns had that headline-making interview with John Fetterman in the race for Pennsylvania Senate. Do we know yet if that report has had any impact on the race or how viewers see John Fetterman? Yeah, Tom, I'm not necessarily sure that that report had an impact on the race, but certainly Adasha's great reporting and the questions about transparency, about John Fetterman's health, ended up producing the letter today from his doctor in advance of the debate saying that John Fetterman is healthy. And of course, the Oz campaign, as Peter Alexander was just mentioning, ended up saying, well, if you're healthy, why not show up for an extra debate or two? Again, Pennsylvania is a really close state. We saw it in uh, 2020. We saw it in 2016. And I'm not surprised that this race has gotten closer as we get closer to Election Day, just given the polarized nature of the Keystone State. Finally, Mark, I want to pull up an interesting figure from a recent NBC News poll. We can put it up on the screen now. It actually shows, if you take a look at this, Mark, both political parties and their figureheads are, are widely unpopular. I know we try not to read too much into polls, but it's if you look at it a certain way, do you think people in this election are going to be voting for something or do you think they're going to be voting against something? It's probably a little bit of both. But, Tom, you know, our, our po politics is so polarized now. And it's honestly a much different situation it was when you and I first started covering politics uh, a couple of decades ago when there were popular political figures. The, the opposition might not have liked them, but George W. Bush was popular for a large swath of his presidency. Barack Obama was popular. John McCain was popular. But we now have entered this stage where almost every politician, whether past, future, or present, is unpopular in our politics right now. And I think a lot of it just reflects not only the polarized nature of American politics, but also the middle of the electorate is just as polarized as everyone else is. And so I think that is uh, one of the biggest changes that we've seen in our politics over the last decade or two. Mark Murray, one of the best minds in politics. Mark, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. Let's head overseas now. Russian President Vladimir Putin declaring martial law in the four regions of Ukraine he annexed last month. This is Putin's military tries to maintain control as Ukraine pushes to retake territory. NBC News chief international correspondent Kier Simmons joins us now from Moscow. Kier, what does this decision by President Putin to declare martial law exactly mean? I mean, we know what martial law means and the Russian military has been in these regions. What is different now? Well, Tom, in simple terms, it means that President Putin's military has the ability to 
uh, act uh, more in its own determination there in those annexed areas. But I think, more broadly speaking, what this is, is, is President Putin and his military taking a firmer grip, uh, pushing, really... We, we've talked in the past, Tom, uh, about whether or not uh, President Putin would be prepared to compromise. Uh, I think this is a sign of exactly the opposite, uh, 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 pushing harder, uh, doubling down, if you like. A little uh, noticed aspect of this presidential decree is that it doesn't just bring in that martial law in those particular areas. It extends right across the country. For example, here in Moscow, cars can now be searched. I think that is a, a sign, Tom, once again, that President Putin sees himself in this for the long term and that domestically he's determined to maintain control while he, while he tries to attain a victory uh, there in Ukraine. Here, I want to build on some of the reporting you did for us earlier this week and last week. We have this new reporting from the New York Times that hundreds of thousands of men have disappeared, either because they are fleeing the country or they're being drafted. You're in Moscow. What's it like on the ground there? You know, Tom, uh, since I've, I've been here, and as you know, I've been here many times this year, there is definitely a change, a change in the atmosphere. There is most certainly fewer uh, men on, on the streets. Uh, that's, some of that will be because they've gone to fight. Some of it will be because they've, they've left the country. And we actually crossed the border into the neighboring Kazakhstan. I've got to tell you, it, it was extraordinary. Uh, everywhere we went, we found groups of young people, mostly young men, who were talking about the fact they had, that they had left the country. That being said, the support for President Putin here in Russia, uh, including here in Moscow, is still very strong. Independent polling does show that the thing that makes russians most anxious is that partial draft that fear that their brothers their husbands their fathers might be uh, called up uh, for military uh, action and i think that just un underscores again the, the issue that we began with here tom which is that for president putin this is no longer just a a, a foreign escapade if you like it is a domestic issue and it goes to the heart of his strength in Russia and that again is why he clearly is determined to double down not to compromise to the worsening immigration crisis in this country a migrant tent camp opening up right here in New York City coming nearly two weeks after the mayor declared a state of emergency amid the influx of thousands of migrants sent from Texas and Florida NBC Stephanie Gosk has this story Tonight, asylum seekers arriving to a tent camp in New York City, a new facility that is preparing to take in hundreds of migrants. The latest effort by the city to house the more than 20,000 asylum seekers coming from Texas and Florida, crowding an already strained shelter system. Mayor Eric Adams hoping to solve what he calls a humanitarian crisis. We were hit with this unprecedented influx, and what did we do? We pivoted and shifted to make sure that we addressed it. The 84,400 square foot facility is made up of three giant white tents, slated to temporarily house as many as 500 single male migrants, with wall-to-wall -wall cots, laundry center, cafeteria, and recreation area. Overnight, Google Maps labeling the location, quote, Adams Tent City. It's unclear where the label came from. But the project has been at the center of the heated immigration debate. Governors from other states like Texas sending migrants to New York, saying states with more liberal laws should handle the influx at the southern border. After Florida Governor Ron DeSantis chartered a plane with migrants to Martha's Vineyard weeks ago. Politicians ramping up the rhetoric ahead of the midterm elections. Joe Biden's five million illegal aliens are on the verge of replacing you. In New York, the mayor now under fire for housing the migrants on Randall's Island. Republicans say it's a waste of money, while critics from the left say the tents are unacceptable. The tent city is horrible. It's just a repeat of what they're escaping right now. The new facility was put here on an island that has no housing for New York City residents and few facilities after concerns about flooding caused the city to scrap plans to set up tents in the Bronx. Women and children are being housed in hotels in the city. It's just the men in the facility here and there are lots of services for them as well medical services as well as caseworkers who will help them to start navigating the very complicated immigration process tom 
Stephanie Gosk for us tonight. Stephanie, we thank you. For more, I want to bring in Monsignor Kevin Sullivan, Executive Director of Catholic Charities of New York. He is on the front lines of this crisis and has called on the federal government for more help. Monsignor, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. I, I know you're seeing this problem up close. That's why I wanted to have you on Top Story. You're not a politician. Tell me what you're seeing day in, day out. I'm seeing people who are fleeing for their lives from... Venezuela, for the most part, a few other countries. And they're both seeking safety here, but they're also seeking opportunity. Because when they arrive here, one of the first things they say to us is, can we get a job? They're here to make this the land of opportunity that the United States and New York has been for more than a century. The, the mayor has declared a state of emergency on this crisis. I'm trying to understand this, and, and I don't want to get political, but I want to understand, if New York City is the greatest city in the world, how can we not handle the influx of migrants? Border towns with much smaller budgets, much smaller populations, have been doing this for decades. W why can't New York figure this out? New York has done this for a century of welcoming new people. What we have is an unprecedented situation where migrants aren't really coming as they usually do um, in, in, in small groups, et cetera. They come to family members, to other communities. But they're we, being sent sometimes to the wrong, wrong addresses as well, I know. Absolutely. And, and so they're being sent here. Yes, you know, they probably sign a document that says they're coming voluntarily, but, but they really are being bussed here. And that's what's creating the crisis. Sure, we can handle it. We want immigrants to come. But the way that they're coming without any preparation, just being bussed here, that's what's creating the crisis. Then why, do, why are you asking for federal help if we can handle this? We can handle it with federal help. We can, we can absorb the people who are coming here, but we need the help of the federal government. This Give me is, examples of what. Are you talking about money? Are you talking about more tent cities? What, what exactly are you talking there about? There are a few things that the federal government needs to do. One, there is the, the funding to provide some of the services that, that are needed. Secondly, there's the policy that would enable those come here to have the ability to work. They need work permits. There also needs to be a policy in Texas at the border for an orderly receiving of people who are applying for asylum so that they can have their cases heard in a very expeditious way. So there's a lot that the federal government can do. And that's why we have a crisis in New York, because immigration is a national problem. It's not Texas's problem. It's not New York's problem. It's the problem of the United does States. Does the mayor, does he have a, a, a grasp and a handle of what's happening here? I think New York City has been very welcoming. I think this... That's not what I asked. I mean, I, 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 we see the video. We see people being greeted when they're coming off the buses. Yeah. But I'm asking if he has a grasp on how to handle the situation. He's calling it a crisis, calling it a state of emergency. I just want to make sure these human beings, these families are being taken care of. These, these people are being taken care of. Are there mistakes? Is there a lot? Or is the system overwhelmed? Without a doubt. But New York City has opened its arms to receiving people who are here. And it's not just city government. And that's the mistake that a lot of people make. This is not the government's problem alone. It's all of us. That's why I've been at parishes that have opened their churches, their basements to feed people. I've been at community groups that are welcoming. It's why Catholic Charities has seen over 2,000 people. This is not merely a government problem. This is New York's problem. It's the nation's problem. And all of us have to pitch in to do it. And it's not going to be perfect. It's a crisis. Things don't always work out. But when we make mistakes, then we have to get it right. Let me ask you about the schools. We've seen reports about public schools uh, maybe getting a little crowded, maybe public schools not being ready for this. Are parish schools in the city taking in immigrants, do you know? We have made an offer that any, um, any of the asylum seekers who are here, if they want, they will, we will find a way for them to get a scholarship to come to our Catholic schools. Now, as of yet, we're still working through it, but we've made that offer for our schools to be open. The migrants that are coming here, when you're talking to them, do they want to stay or do they want to go to a different state? Most of them want to stay here. Some want to go other places. And why do they want to stay here? Because New York is the premier city of opportunity in the United States. So that's why they want to stay. Here. Do they understand that, that they're being in some ways used as political pawns right now? Do they understand that? I don't know whether they understand that or not. I know that they are coming here because they see New York as a place of safety and of opportunity. I don't know whether they, they, they understand they're being used in that way. 
All right, Monsignor Kevin Sullivan, I want to thank you because Catholic Charities always does good work all over the country, all over the world, helping people. And I know it's not easy. I know you're dealing with a lot of people every single day, including families. So we thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. All right, Monsignor. Still ahead tonight, the medical emergency at an elementary school in Missouri. Several students rushed to the hospital after getting sick this afternoon. What firefighters discovered at the scene. Plus, the chilling new video of that deadly plane crash in Ohio and the investigation now underway. And the new body cam footage out of Florida. Why deputies are going door to door and arresting people because of their voter registration. Top story just getting started on this Wednesday night. We're back now with never before seen body cam footage out of Florida showing shocked and confused residents being arrested for voter fraud. The arrest took place in August as part of Governor DeSantis's crackdown of illegal voting by felons. The move prompting some criticism over how the state has contributed to mass confusion over who can and cannot vote. Carrie Sanders has this story. Apparently, I, I guess you have a warrant? For what? I'm not it's sure. for voter stuff, man. For voters. Just released body camera recordings show officers in Florida making felony voter fraud arrests. We have a warrant for your arrest. For what? For the voter fraud. Good, how are you, sir? In all, 20 arrested following a statewide investigation into individuals who the state say voted even though they'd lost their civil rights and could not vote because they'd been convicted on either murder charges or a sex offense. So you have a warrant. It's for voter fraud, okay? Ramana Oliver was one among many who's confused. Yes, she had served 19 years for second-degree murder, but she wondered... How could she be under arrest? Florida had passed an amendment giving most convicted felons the right to vote after being released from prison. She had applied and was seemingly granted the right to vote. She and others were even issued voter registration cards by supervisors of elections. I'm like, voter fraud? I voted, but I ain't fraud, commit no fraud. Well, yeah, so th that's the thing. I, I don't know exactly what happened with it, but you, you do have a warrant. That's what it's for. Okay. Oh, my God. Last year, Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis created the Florida Office of Election Crimes and Security. I don't think there's any other place in the country where you should have more confidence that your vote counts than in the state of Florida, which is great. <laughs> But critics charge the crime lies not with voters like Tony Patterson, who served more than six years behind bars. Because of your sex offender status, you're not supposed to be voting. I don't know this. Rather, the problem was created when the state issued them voters' registration cards. And that determination was made by the state? Absolutely. And she got a voter's card? Yes. And she went and voted? Absolutely. And then afterwards, they came forward and said... You violated the law. Two years later. Nathan Hart, who served time for a sex crime, is now among those accused of voter fraud and fears being sent back to prison. I've never thought of killing myself. Suicide has never even been a thought that seriously entered my mind. But there's a lot of days when I secretly wish or even pray that I just don't wake up in the morning because I don't want to have to deal with this all over again. Carrie Sanders joins us now. And Carrie, it's pretty incredible because from the body cam video, you see exactly what's happening here with the confusion. Technically, these people broke the law even though they thought they could vote. You know, in the abstract, you're absolutely correct. They did break the law. They should not have been voting. But, for instance, Ramona Oliver, she not only got her voter's registration card from the state, from the Hillsborough County Supervisor Elections, but as she was leaving prison after serving 19 years, the Department of Corrections told her, yes, you can register to vote. She said, are you sure? And they said, yes, you can register to vote. So this has been a very confusing situation. And quite frankly, if this goes to trial, well, then we'll see how potentially a jury figures all of this out if it goes to trial, Tom. Yeah, Karen, I guess I have to ask you that part because as, as we just mentioned, okay, they broke the law, but clearly officials told them you could go vote. They got a voter registration card. A at what point does the state say, look, maybe we messed up as well? Yeah, well, they haven't said that so far. And if this does go to court, for instance, uh, some of these trials are already set for November after the midterm. So Ramona Oliver is set to go to trial in December. And if she or others were to be convicted, they could be sent back to prison for up to five years. So there's a, there's a lot of high anxiety here, too, Tom.
Carrie Sanders for us tonight from Fort Lauderdale. Carrie, we thank you for that. When we come back, the skeleton kidnapped a 14-foot Halloween decoration snatched in broad daylight. The reward its owner is now offering to get it back. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed and the chilling new video of that deadly plane crash in Ohio. Take a look at this surveillance video showing the plane falling right out of the sky, nose diving straight into the ground before going up into flames. A pilot and passenger on board both killed. The NTSB now investigating that video as they work to determine what exactly caused that accident. A carbon monoxide leak sickening several students at an elementary in Kansas City, Missouri. Seven children and two adults rushed to the hospital after they began to feel nauseous. The carbon monoxide monitors in the school maxing out indicated extremely high levels of the toxic gas. Firefighters say they found a leak in the boiler room. All other students were medically cleared. And the Halloween season off to a tricky start for one Texas woman after a 14-foot skeleton was stolen off her lawn. Take a look at the ring cam footage. It captured the moment a person pulls down the massive decoration during the day, then struggles to drag it into their car. The thief has yet to be identified, but the owner is now issuing a $50 reward, 50 big ones for the skeleton's return. And next tonight, something not so scary, just very exciting. The launch of a new show here on NBC News Now, Special Edition with Andrew Ross Sorkin. The limited series will feature in-depth interviews with key newsmakers. And tonight, Andrew sat down with Pfizer's CEO, Albert Borarla. I'm excited to be joined by Andrew now. He's, of course, anchor of Squawk Box on CNBC and a New York Times columnist. Andrew, thanks for joining Top Story again. So excited you're here. We're going to talk about that interview in just a moment. But first, I want to talk to you about the show. You know, our viewers know you from CNBC, Deal Book. Right. Of course, you're the best-selling author of Too Big to Fail. You produce movies. You co-created Showtime's Billions. Andrew, you have enough jobs. Why are you coming to news now? You know, I, I just needed to be more near you, Tom. I mean, look, I mean, you know, you, you got, you've got a lot of real estate there, and I just wanted a little tiny piece of it. But I, no, I feel I'm you, following I, your footsteps. I feel, I feel you streaming. I'm following your streaming footsteps. That's the goal. Well, that, that leads to my next question. Do you think streaming is the future? Everyone knows this is sort of where viewers are going. The financial picture, though, is still unclear. Netflix came under some pressure. We, of course, right. know what happened to CNN+. Plus. Netflix bounced back, though. We should mention that, though, too. Everyone seems to have a streaming network now. What does the future hold, do you think, for streaming? Oh, I think there's no question that streaming is the future. Um, there's that, that, I mean, I, I think it's categorical that that's where it's going to go. I think there's probably a bit of a question of what's the model. Some of these uh, will be subscription services. Some will be ad-driven. Uh, increasingly, we're going to see this sort of hybrid model where you're going to pay a little bit of money, and then there's an ad-driven piece on top. That's what Netflix is now doing, and so many of the others are following. And then there's this last piece, which is you're going to probably see a little bit of recombination where instead of you know buying one service or another service or another, you'll start to buy bundles, which might look a little bit like, yep, cable, but it'll be streaming. All right. And then Bloomberg says we're, we're heading for a recession. They think there's a 100 percent chance we, we enter a recession. A lot of smart people like Jamie Dimon think the same thing. What do you think the next year looks like for Americans and day-to-day -day living here in this country? I hate to say it because I think it's going to be tough. Uh, the good news is I think that ultimately inflation will come down. The bad news is, well, unemployment will likely go up and the cost of getting a mortgage and the cost of servicing your credit cards will also go up. So it's going to be a shaky period. In fact, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, uh, took to Twitter uh, just last night and said it's time to batten down the hatches. And I think ultimately that's what's going to probably look like. The real question is, if you look over the last 40 years, most of the economy has actually gotten better and better and better over those 40 years. But there have been these periods, a year or two, where if you held your breath or you closed your eyes, if you woke up a year or two later, things would be better. The question is, is that the case this time or does it look like something different? Yeah, we're going to have to wait and see. So talk to me about your new show. Why did you want to do this? You, you, you already have, as we talked about, real estate. You have a show on CNBC. You obviously have a huge platform with The New York Times and everything else you do. Talk to me about Special Edition and how it's different. Look, you know, in the morning on Squawk Box and, and so often on TV, we get to do these, you know, 
three, four, five, maybe seven, 10 minute long interviews uh, at the most. And I've always loved that great conversation, that long form nuanced interview where you really get to go deep and you get to really understand not just what people are saying, but the way they think, why they think what they think. And I've always thought that if you could show that on TV and the viewers can see that, even if they don't like the answers, even if the answer to them to them is unsatisfying or disappointing, that is the answer. And you and you learn from that. And the opportunity to do that uh, on this network streaming uh, was just, you know, chance of a lifetime. And here we are. Yeah, and there's no doubt viewers want more. They want to listen to more. We've seen so many podcasts come out that are just conversations that are hours long, but people eat them up. Talk to me about your first guest. You sat down with the CEO of Pfizer. We actually have a clip for us, though. Let's take a listen. I think um, it's going to be tough, and it's going to be tough. Already we see uh, the wave coming up in Europe. Usually there are four or five weeks uh, after Europe that we see the wave in, the wave in the U.S. Uh, and then follows the rest of the world. Um, thank God we do have vaccine that it is very effective against this virus, but not many people uh, have done it so far. So if we won't pick up between now and the next five weeks in vaccinations rates in the U.S. Uh, so that people will be immune, uh, I think it will be a tough winter. CEO of Pfizer, they're talking about the winter that's going to come. He thinks it's going to be pretty bad. A stark warning there. But here's the thing, Andrew. He's gotten COVID twice himself. Roughly, roughly 5% of eligible Americans have gotten the updated COVID boosters. He was talking about that there for a moment. He's in the business of selling boosters. Did you press him on all this? Absolutely. And, and that's why we wanted to talk to him, because here is this, this person, this embodiment of the issues and skepticism, frankly, that, that so many Americans have about vaccines and about uh, mandates and about issues around free speech and social media and all of the things that I think we've been debating uh, around the dinner tables at homes across this country for so long. And here's Alba Brill, the CEO of Pfizer, who has gotten COVID literally twice in two months and people scratch their head and they say, well, if, if, if he can get it, I can get it. Why should I even be taking this? And really sort of peeling back the onion and trying to understand, A, what happened to him. This is the first time he's spoken out uh, since he, he publicly uh, acknowledged that he got COVID twice in such a short period of time. And then really walking through these other issues, these larger issues about uh, the skepticism towards vaccines and not just uh, COVID vaccines, but really the backlash against even vaccines more broadly and what that means for the country and for health and science. I mean, those were the kinds of things that we talk about uh, in this conversation. Yeah, and straddling those two lines, right, being the first line of defense in this pandemic, but at the same time, making sure you're making profits for, for your board of directors and everyone else who's buying stock in your company. Definitely an interesting interview. Andrew, we can't wait for this. We're so happy you're on NBC News now. We're going to look forward to this. And every time well, you have a big you. interview, I'm you can come right back you. here. All right, Andrew, we thank you for that. You can catch more of the Pfizer interview on Special Edition with Andrew Ross Sorkin tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern only on NBC News Now. And coming up, Top Stories Global Watch will take you to Naples and the unbelievable images after this building collapsed. You won't believe what was being housed inside. And North Korea moving forward with more missile launches and update on their latest war games as pressure builds in the region. Stay with us. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, and in Chile, protesters clashing with police on the third anniversary of deadly riots there. New video showing authorities firing tear gas and water cannons at demonstrators in Santiago. It comes after more than 30 people died during riots to protest mass inequality back in 2019. The country's current president, who supported those protests three years ago, pledging to work towards a more equal society. The oldest cemetery building in Naples, Italy, collapsing, leaving coffins hanging from the walls. These images are graphic. They're just coming in. Tonight, they show those coffins dangling in midair after the collapse. No one was at the cemetery when it happened. Authorities are now investigating the incident. It comes after another collapse there destroyed roughly 300 burial uh, monuments back in January. And North Korea firing hundreds of artillery shells into the senior South Korea. The launch coming in as the U.S. and South Korea hold military drills near the border. The broader joint exercises, which began Monday, drawing the ire of North Korea, this latest round of shelling violating a buffer zone between the North and the South, put into place back in 2018. 
All right, coming up on Top Story, we all have to deal with this. The most annoying person in your life. All right, think about that person right now. Coming up after this break, the tips on how to learn to like them. Yes, like them. That's next. We've all had to deal with that annoying person, either at work, in our families, or in our social circles. Hey, sometimes we may be that annoying person. Well, an article in the Wall Street Journal caught our eye today, offering a possible solution on how to fix how you feel. There's new research suggesting how to fix your relationships, and some of the advice might actually surprise you. Joining us now is Wall Street Journal columnist Elizabeth Bernstein. She wrote that story. She also writes about all things that deal with human interaction and social psychology. And she's the author of the article, Learn to Like the Most Annoying Person in Your Life. Elizabeth, I, I read this. I love the title. I love everything about this because it's so funny. First of all, talk to us about basically how you lay out these specific strategies to learn to like the most annoying people in your life. And you start with saying, give them a second chance. You want to give them a second chance. We all have somebody we don't like. I feel confident about that. But uh, when we want to change our own behavior, we want to have a goal. So you want to set a goal. And the goal can be, I'm just going to try to open up, give this person a second chance. That's just the starting point. Then you find one thing you like, and you hang on to that one thing. Because if you find one thing, and everybody has one thing, I think, then you can keep going. Find that one redeeming quality to the one thing you guys have in common, maybe in a work from that. Next, you say the research support supports watching how both you and they act together. Exactly. And and really carefully, you can start with yourself. And so if start with compassion, because there's a lot of research that shows that if we're compassionate to someone else, we feel better. And, and also, some people, we everybody's walking around right now with something wrong, something's wrong in their life, they're dealing with things. We don't know what that is. Have a little compassion, warm up a little. But, but you're also saying, watch your body language and then don't gossip. What do you mean by that? So watch all of your be your own behavior. When we don't like someone, we tense up, we turn away from them, we complain, we gossip about them. We're not nice to them. Warm all your own behavior up. Be nicer. Give compliments. Don't gossip because that's just going to enforce the negative that you're trying to get away from. This is so much like it's me and not you, right? Um, you say exactly. it's important to spend time together. That seems so hard if you if you can't stand this person. You can't stand the person. But also, often, the people that we don't like, we're forced with. We're at work, or we, we somehow have to see them, or maybe they're a family member that, you know, we see only at certain times. But spend time together, but spend time that's not forced. And here's something I thought was really interesting, again, from the research. When, when someone, when you get invited to do something, you like that person better. So invite the person you actually don't like. They're going to like you more, and then you're going to maybe warm up, but you're going to sort to get this ball going of somehow coming together, which honestly, I feel like we all have to do these but, days. But you know, on this point though, which, which was interesting, you said don't just do small talk. I, I thought small talk is kind of a way in to kind of maybe be kind and maybe break the ice a little bit. Exactly. And I think small talk is like the, the social grease. Like, we need it. We need to warm up. But you don't want to stick with small talk. It's not enough to stay there. You need to really get to know somebody. And that takes more than just a few minutes in an elevator. You need to spend the, that time. It goes back to spending time together so you get to know them. And then th th this one's kind of incredible. Finally, if, if you're dealing with the most annoying person in your life, ask them to bas basically do something together. You want to bond with them? You want to bond. And look, not everybody, we don't, I want to say, we don't have to like everybody. We don't have to get close to everybody. But I think that it's a good goal for many people. Maybe it's just the annoying coworker. It is a good goal. So you want to spend the time, but it's key the activities you do. Elizabeth, you mentioned an I moment, sharing an I moment with this person that you cannot stand. What is an I moment? It's called eye sharing, and uh, there's a whole bunch of research on this. Eye sharing, we think that it's the similarities that keep us, uh, bond us, that, that we get to know people and we bond on what we have in common. But it turns out the research is showing it's something called eye sharing, which is having an experience together and having the same reaction to it. A really good example would be if we go cheer our favorite team on together. We're both having the same response in the moment. Elizabeth Bernstein, there's a lot of work to be done here. We appreciate your time, and I, I'm sure we're all going to be working on this uh, tomorrow in our families and, and at, at the workplace. Elizabeth, thanks for coming on Top Story tonight. And we thank you for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.